How's everybody this morning? Great. Ah, so, um, what's that? That was so two days ago. <laughs> but I was pleased. Share Matthew said, "Man, I thought you were always, you know." younger than I was, or around my age, and she goes, you're really old, aren't you? <laughs> Wasn't quite like that, but anyways. Um, I just want to mention this, the next service after this, because we're going to do something special that we normally don't do, and that is that um, Eddie Watkins and I are going to, with words and music, create an entire prayer service. So instead of doing the normal format, the whole service is going to be a prayer. So if you feel called to be deepened in, in the process and deepened in spirit, um, I invite you to come back and stay for it. It will not be the same talk. I'm, it will not be a talk. Um, so uh, I created this talk for you guys uh, just this morning. So, um, so come back for that if you feel called to. So today we're going to talk about the spring of life. And I want to open with a quote from that guy, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. I found out that my, my, um, my girlfriend's father was born, the, had his birthday as the day before mine, and he was a Baptist preacher. You know, so I said, you know, hey, you're, you're marrying somebody in the same footsteps. Now, what I, from what I understand, he was more of a kind of a new thought Baptist preacher, believe it or not. He eventually left the Baptist church because they wanted him to teach some stuff that he didn't believe in, so, you know, good for him. But anyways, uh, so I must be channeling a little bit of him because we're starting off with Jesus. And in John, he says, Whoever drinks of the water I give him shall never thirst. But the same water which I give him shall become in him a well spring, to me, a well of water springing up to life everlasting. Now, I've read that phrase a number of times, and this time, for some reason, it caught my attention in, in a way, and, and I realized there's two things going on in this phrase. First of all, it's water given. There's water being given by this teacher. Remember in the reading from Ernest Holmes, he says the, the spiritual experience, um, how does that go? It cannot and does not borrow its life from another, no matter how great or noble that, that other may be. But what others do for us is they lead us to the light. They lead us to the water. They, they direct us to what already exists, but we don't pay attention to. Have you ever had that happen before? You're not paying attention to something, and somebody calls your attention to it and says, hey, have you seen that? You're like, have you seen the moon tonight? And you're busy running around going crazy. And, and it's like, oh, no, I never did. So, so he's talking about the water being given. And what is the water being given? In ancient times, in, in that culture, water was life. You know, we had, a, we had a person in the office the other day who had uh, just moved here about four months ago and, uh, from San Diego. And she hit right around the, the time that we were getting all that rain coming through and the windstorm, a couple, remember that, a couple months ago? And, and like that, and so she was talking to her daughter who's in David, going to UC Davis, and she goes, man, it sure, sure rains a lot in Northern California. <laughs> you know? And her daughter, fortunately, is in, is in water resources management, you know, and she goes, first of all, no, it doesn't. We're in the middle of the biggest drought we've ever had. And secondly, this is a blessing. This is a good thing, you know. So, so quit, you know, bringing that San Diego, we don't, don't ever want rain consciousness because we can use a little rain. So, it's like that in, in, in the Middle East when Jesus was talking, that great phrase, you know, the, the rain falls over the heads of the just and the unjust alike. You know, those of, uh, those of you who know me for a while know that I come from Seattle, and so, you know, over there, the, of course the rain falls. It falls all the time, you know. And so I, I was just looking at my friend David Alexander, who's in Portland, he posted on, on his church, you know, uh, thing for Facebook page for today. It's like, Portland is back to normal, it's raining you know, and so it's, it's um, so rain is normal, normal for some people, but for places where it's dry, like the Palestine Peninsula where Jesus was living, it's life, it's good, it's prosperity, it's everything you want. 
It's life-giving energy. So he's giving, he's talking about being able to give this life-giving energy. And what is it? It's the life-giving energy of awareness, of pointing out what's already there, of pointing out the God within, of pointing out the spiritual teachings of what already exists and how to work with that God within. He can give us this. But then it says, and eventually this becomes a wellspring within you, a well of water springing up when, from within you. And what he's basically saying is, eventually the spiritual teacher needs to put himself or herself out of business. Because eventually you get the spiritual experience that Ernest Holmes talked about, of where you start to experience the water, where you start to experience the God within as flowing through you. And you start to work with that, and it starts to become a new reality, a new way of being. And once you touch that, you realize that the spring is within you, always has been, but you needed the teacher to show you where it was and to help guide you to how to use it and work with it. You know, Emma Curtis Hopkins talks about that the Americas, North and South America, were uh, always you know, on the planet. They always existed as far as, you know, for, for human history is concerned. But they were undiscovered by Europeans for centuries, for ages. Leif Erikson had been over in, in, you know, what, 1200 or 1100 or something like that, you know, a few hundred years before Columbus, but nobody had come over and really tapped into what we had and discovered it. Nobody had come over and gotten excited enough to bring other people over to live in the place. Now, the Native Americans probably have a different version <laughs> of that story and a different idea of that story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's the idea of we, we tap into undiscovered lands. And when we first tap into this teaching, it's an undiscovered land, and we have to learn how to live in it. And that's what teachers and guides are fabulous for, is to both point out the land and then to help us to learn how to live in it, hopefully in a more healthy way than, than uh, Columbus did with America. It becomes a well of water springing up from within. And as the, teacher, the teachings are learned and applied, they become our personal spiritual experience. Okay? And we experience the nature of God pouring through us, and the fountain is now within us. One of the things that we talk about here is that we are not a, a teaching that, or a church that believes in revelatory teaching. Revelatory means I believe in what somebody else experienced. Okay? And I read that book, and I try and, and get what that person got. We are a directive experience. We, we direct people to have their own direct experience of spirit. That's my goal for each of you. That's all of our goal for each of you, is that you have the direct experience of spirit, so that you find that fountain that lives, moves, breathes within you and flows within you, and from that begin to create your life. And so all we're here to do is chatter at you on Sunday to remind you of the fact that that's already going. That fountain is already running. So Jesus uses water. Moses says, let the earth bring forth. And it's the same metaphor. It's the same thing that he's talking about. It's the Genesis creation story, let there be. And what they're saying is the, the earth and the water is the mind. And we first of all experience it as the mind, but it's really the divine mind within us. Ernest Holmes says there's only one mind, capital M, mind. And each of us is an individual expression of it. Each of us is using that one mind. We're all tapped into it. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So we're all tapped into that. There's only the one mind. Whatever, when, as we learn how to use that mind more wisely, the earth brings forth. Everything springs forth. When we learn how to work that fountain of life, it brings forth its own nature. And its nature is love, its nature is health, its nature is strength, its nature is prosperity, its nature is good in every form. And as we learn to open to the flow of that spring within us, that becomes what our life looks like. It's only when we don't know that it's there or misuse how it's there that it becomes something else. And so we're here to, as Jesus again said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek that fountain, of that spring within you, that spring of life within you. You know, it's the thing that we should be spending our whole lives working for because after you find that, everything else gets added. Including the red firebirds, right, Twyla? Yes. You know, all the stuff. 
It's not that you go off and become a monk living in a cave and having a living the life of, of an ascetic, you know, eating on, uh, you know, like the Buddha did for a while on, on one grain of rice per day. Even he said that sucks after a while. <laughs> I, I didn't think he quite used that word, but, you know, it's, it's, it didn't work. So he went back the, the middle way. It's living a life of joy. It's living a life. You know, people say, get a life. You can say, yeah, I got one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Emma Curtis Hopkins says, the man appears sick to you because you see him that way. If you let your spirit tell what it sees, there will be no talk about sickness, no discussion of what is distressing anybody. All things are waiting to be looked upon as they really are. Isn't that an interesting thing? So do we look at things with human eyes? With human eyes, we see our beliefs in fear, in lack, sickness, death, all that good stuff that we see with our human race consciousness, you know, what we've been conditioned to believe and see. With our spiritual eyes, looking as God sees, it's not that we're looking with beliefs or through beliefs, we're looking with and experiencing our knowing. Because when you come to the spiritual belief, when you come to the spiritual knowing, there's a part of you that says, oh my God, I, I always knew this. Many of you have had the experience of walking into a center like this and saying, God, somebody's teaching or talking about what I already know to be the truth. I feel like I'm coming home. Because we already know it. You know, when I was a kid in grade school, I, I went to Catholic schools, in Catholic grade school and high school, and when they started teaching about, you know, God is love, yeah, I knew that. And these people are going to hell if they don't practice Catholicism. I went, wait a minute. I don't know that. That's not what I know. I know God is love. And so when we look with our spiritual eyes, we have the experience of knowing. And then we start seeing abundant good. We start seeing life. We start seeing the health. We start seeing lo love, the joy. We start seeing the nature of God everywhere. You know, it's like when you decide that one day you want to buy yourself a, a yellow Volkswagen Beetle or bug, you start seeing yellow Volkswagen bugs everywhere, right? Because you suddenly put your consciousness on that. When we start looking with God eyes, when we start looking with those spiritual eyes, we start seeing that same stuff everywhere, and we can even look at the same situation that anybody else is looking at, and we're seeing it in a different way. We're seeing it in a different way. We don't see the person who's sick. I remember one time I was, when I was early in religious science, I was praying, I had a cold, and I was praying hard, real hard, to get over that cold. I wanted that cold healed, you know, and out of my body. And all of a sudden, a little voice said, the cold is not sickness. It's just your body's method of releasing what doesn't work in it right now. I was like, oh, that's a whole rearrangement of ideas right there. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, it's messy. But it's a perfectly healthy process. If I didn't have that process going on, then I would have a problem. And so what that did was it started to me on a different path. I said, okay, so anytime I started getting something that felt like cold after this, my first question is, what needs to be released? And I started to do the emotional and the inner work of releasing whatever I needed to, and usually within a day or two, the cold symptoms would pass or would just never settle in at all, instead of the two to three weeks it would normally take to get rid of it. And it totally rearranged my thinking to say, wait, this thing that we call sickness is just a process of the body. It's perfectly healthy. It's a perfect functioning of what the body is supposed to do. We start to rearrange it, and we start to see it differently. I want to also unpack the statement that she says, the last statement in that little paragraph, all things are waiting to be looked upon as they actually are. Think about that. The true nature of everything is already here. It's already here. And it's waiting for us to see it. It blossoms forth as we look at it, as we see its true nature. That's what we are here for. That's the, from the old myth, the kiss that awakens the sleeping princess. We have the power. That's an archetype within our consciousness. We have the power to give that kiss to everything. And it awakens from its slumber, it awakens from its not being seen or being seen the way that everyone else sees it 
came to the way that it truly is the true spiritual nature. We are God consciousness focused, individualized right here, right now. And all that the rest of the world, the rest of the nature is doing is waiting for us to see it just as we are waiting for someone else to see us as our true nature. Don't you love it when somebody really sees the beauty of who you are? A couple of you do. <laughs> the rest? Yeah. Oh, good, okay. We love that. We love it. You know, we, we know people who, you know, you got somebody who considers, the, the rest of the office considers the office grump, but there's this one person who refuses to see that person as the office grump, and they see them as the kind, loving person, and guess what they are to that person always? Kind and loving. Because that's what the expectation, that's what the person sees. You know, we've heard the studies of teachers who were, you know, had children, you know, get, you know assigned to them that really didn't have it, you know, all together, you know, study-wise, but they were told these are the best and the brightest of the children in our class. And what did they get? The children acted as the best and brightest because they saw their true nature and they stopped telling them that they were stupid and they stopped telling them that they didn't get it. They didn't know to tell them that. So we are here to see nature in its true essence. All things are waiting to be looked upon as they really are. That's our job. The Buddha, when he was asked, said, I am awake. You know, who are you? Are you the saint? Are you the reincarnation of this great master? And he says, no, I'm just awake. And what he means by it is he can see clearly. He said, I can remember all my past lives. He says, I can see it all clearly. I can see how it all works and how it all fits. I can see. He could see clearly and he could see truth, capital T, truth, fully, full of truth. He could see the nature as it was. That's what we're doing. We're in the process of waking up, waking up, waking up to where can we start to see the truth of what life really is instead of believing what we've been told that life really is. Paul, I must be in a Christian mood today. Paul says, <laughs> For now we see through a mirror darkly, but then, and the then is when, when we become in the perfect mind, but then face to face. So when we see with human eyes, we, see, we don't just see the, the thing out there fuzzily. We're looking at a mirror is what he's saying. We're not even seeing what's out there. We're seeing the mirror, and the mirror is, duck, is dark and dirty. Okay? Seeing through a mirror darkly. When we're looking at it, we're filled with what's in our own mind, with race, filled with race beliefs. This is bad, that's wrong, this isn't good, and on and on and on, and all that stuff. When we start to perfect our mind, when we start to wake up, okay, then we start to see the clear, perfect mind sees face to face with divine nature. It's not looking at the mirror anymore. Not only is it not dirty, it's not looking at the mirror anymore. It's seeing face to face. Amen. Who are you? I see you for the divine being you are. I see the divine nature in you as who and what you are. When we're in that perfect mind, when we're awake to that. And my invitation for this week is to practice being in that mind as much as you can. And it's hard sometimes because we're so conditioned to go back to sleep, go back to sleep, go back to sleep. And so my invitation this week is to stay awake. This is the mind that Christ was in Christ Jesus. When, when Paul says we need to have the mind that was in Christ Jesus, it's the mind again of awakeness. It's the mind again that sees truthfully. So the Christ mind is full of praise and gratitude. It's not full of criticism. It's full of praise and gratitude. If you find yourself praising and being grateful, you're in a Christ mind. If you find yourself criticizing and putting down, you're not in the Christ mind. You're in the mirror mind. Just notice. Just pay attention. Don't, <clears throat> don't beat yourself up if you find you're in the mirror mind. Okay? That's just more of the mirror mind. Okay, no hammers. Be compassionate with yourself. Be compassionate with others. But just notice and say, wait a minute. Oh my God, I'm back in that mirror mind again. Let me get back into it. What can I praise and find gratitude for in this situation? 
What can I praise and find gratitude for in this situation? And some of the stuff is challenging. But that's what we're here for. In Genesis, in the, Genesis has two creation stories in it. Are most of you aware of that? Two different creation stories right up front, chapter 1 and chapter 2. First one is the mystical version. First one is through God's eyes. God said, let there be, and there was, and God saw it that it was good. Okay? God saw it, and it was good. No fault, nothing wrong with any of it. That's us. That's how God's eyes see us. The second creation story is the creation story through human eyes, which has lots of pain, punishment, suffering, evil, separation, and all that other stuff. That's Adam and Eve. You know, you got a garden, but you can't, you can't, you don't have freedom in the garden. You got to stay away from this stuff over here. You know, and if you do, and then you have some temptations going through the garden. If you do, you're you're out of here, man. You're going to suffer and 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 you know get hurt for the rest of your life, right? That's the human Genesis story. And both stories are always available to us. The mystical, we see it all as good. And the human, we see punishment and hurt and suffering and try to avoid it and try to fix it. They're both available to us. Which one do we choose? There's a Native American, you know, which wolf do you feed? Are those two stories. Which one do we encourage in our own minds? Now, there's a difference, by the way, I just want to be clear, between calling it all good and having wisdom and discernment. Okay? It's okay to have wisdom and discernment and say, you know, if I go down this path and do this thing, it's probably going to cause some pain. I'm not going to do that. But I'm not going to call it evil, bad, and condemn it. I'm just going to use discernment and not, fall down, not go down that path. So this week, your daily practice is twofold. Number one, is to see as much as you can with that God eyes. To see as much as you can and praise it and be grateful. Okay? We good with that one? Okay. The second one is there's an affirmation in your program that I invite you to work with. It will support you in that practice. And let's practice that by reading it together. I, I. put your name there, I, David, as spirit, as spirit, do not accuse the world or myself of any wrongdoing. All is good in living demonstration before me. God is my father and mother. I have not inherited disease. God is my help. God is my strength. God is my abundant good. I invite you to play with that this week. I invite you to take that as part of your spiritual practice on a daily basis, read through it a few times until it starts to really sink in. Hopefully there's parts of that that really resonated with you. I love that God is my father and mother. You know, it, it takes care of a whole lot of stuff, doesn't it? <laughs> a whole lot of dis- disease that isn't always just physical. I'm going to close with a quote from Emma. She says, this is Emma Curtis Hopkins. She says, Moses and Jesus teach the same story. Let it be of the soul you speak. Let spirit utter itself. The evil disposition, the greed, the appetite of mankind is all unreality. It signifies how far we are from seeing spiritual truth when we see evil. You can see for yourself that if God the good is omnipresent, then that which is not good is not present. If God is all there is, we've been playing with that idea for the last three weeks, if God is all there is and God is good, there's nothing else going on. We may think there's something else going on. <clears throat> we may believe there's something else going on. Did you have my water bottle, Mary? But there is nothing else going on. Thank you. This is good. So let us move into prayer. 
So, breathing deeply into this truth, God is all there is. God, by whatever name we give it, Spirit, Allah, Adonai, all the names, Tao, the Buddha mind, Vishnu, Brahman, whatever name we give it, it is all that there is. There is nothing else but that. And because it is, and because its nature is love, because its nature is good, every mystic who's ever had a mystical experience has had the experience of this magnificent love, this omnipresent good, far beyond our imagination, far beyond our ideas of good and bad. I love the Rumi poem, out beyond ideas of right thinking and wrong thinking, there's a field, I'll meet you there. That is the field of the divine. That is the field of the infinite. And I know that because that is all there is, that infinite presence is all there is, that each of us and everything and every one we encounter is one of this infinite presence right here, right now. And so it is automatically one of the love and one of the good, just simply awaiting for us to see it within ourselves and within everyone else and everything else. We are that already. The mind that was in Christ Jesus is already within us. The spring of water is already within us. We don't have to go find it. We don't have to go make it happen. It already is. And so I speak my word from that awareness that each and every person here and each and every person within the sound of this voice, of my voice, recognizes and becomes more and more and more aware of this bubbling spring of life energy the spring of beauty, the spring of love, the spring of joy, the spring of health and great good that is already present in, through, and as each of us right here, right now. We stop looking outside of ourselves and we find it within and we begin to live from that spring ever more fully and ever more presently. We become aware. We see with God's eyes. We Treat the world with praise, with gratitude, with love, with tenderness and compassion. We treat ourselves with praise, with love, with gratitude, with tenderness and compassion. We allow that to be our paradigm, because that is God's paradigm. We allow ourselves to be agents of God on the planet. Agents of that divine. Agents of that high consciousness. And so in great gratitude for each person who says yes to this, in great gratitude for the good that then manifests from this and the greater expression of love that is present here and now, I'm grateful. I release this word spoken, planted into the seed of consciousness, planted into the law that makes it happen, that moves it into form and expression in our lives. I release this word fully, completely, and let it manifest in each of our lives in the most beautiful, powerful way possible right here and right now. And so it does. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you. Love you, David. So I invite the ushers to come forward. So